we will refer here to Art of the Holocaust as art created during the years of 1933 to 1945. When discussing a work of Holocaust art, one should explore the circumstances in which the artwork was created and the artist's biography, as well as what the artist chose to depict and in what way, to try and understand what he was trying to convey, which is not always absolutely evident. Art from the Holocaust requires careful contextualization. It is important to seek answers for questions such as who created the art, with what purpose, under which circumstances. Exploring each painting from the Holocaust, looking in detail at what's represented in it and appreciating its artistic elements, together with the study of the context in which it was created and the questions each artwork arises, deepen our understanding of the Holocaust in general. Art should be used as a tool in addition to the historical knowledge. It is important to keep in mind that the artworks you choose to work with should be selected in keeping with the Ad Vashem's educational philosophy in an age-appropriate manner. Let's turn now to learn about the artist Felix Nussbaum and one of his paintings. Felix Nussbaum was born in Osnabrück, Germany in 1904 and studied art in different cities across Europe. In 1933, he was living in Rome as a student from the Berlin Academy of Arts. When the Nazis rose to power, his scholarship was terminated because he was Jewish. Knowing that his studio back home had been destroyed by the Nazis, he refused to return to Germany and he found asylum as a foreign resident in 1935 in Brussels, Belgium, with his then partner and future wife, Felka Platek. Following the occupation of Belgium by the Nazis, Nussbaum was sent to the camp of Saint Cyprian in southern France. He eventually managed to escape and reunite with his wife in Belgium. As fugitives, with no legal papers, they had to go into hiding. Nussbaum's art during this period expresses the bitter fate of European Jewry under Nazi occupation. In this painting, a man sits lumped in a chair, his head buried in his hands in a gesture of utter despair. Next to him rest a walking stick and a bundle of belongings. He is ready to go. But where would he go? Which country could he flee to? Which country would open its doors to him? A long table, bare except for a globe, dominates the room. The globe's right side is covered by a shade that appears to be growing and covering the whole globe. The room resembles a jail cell, but in the painting there is no closed door. Still, the man appears as a prisoner in the room. His position and body language transmit feelings of desperation and frustration. Through the arched doorway, bare trees can be seen. A flock of ravens circle overhead, all symbols of death in art. The painting is a reflection of Felix Nussbaum's fear and desperation on the eve of the Second World War, at which point he was already a refugee. As Germany's threatening shadow sweeps across Europe, the artist is left with no escape route. The desolation of the room signifies his helplessness, while the bleak view in the distance reflects grim reality. For the Jew, there is no refuge. Let's now turn to see what were his options. This map shows the approximate number of Jews that lived in each country and the percentage they represented out of the total population in each country. For example, in Germany, in 1933, there were 525,000 Jews. They represented 0.8% of the population. During the first years of Nazi rule, tens of thousands of Jews left Germany every year while they still had some choice in their destination and could prepare for emigration. Maybe Poland, with more than 3 million Jews, was an option for them? Maybe, if they could get a visa and the means to get there, it could have been as many other countries. In 1938, as the situation deteriorated for Jews under direct Nazi rule, especially after the annexation of Austria and the Kristallnacht pogrom, emigration became an immediate, urgent necessity. As many countries closed their gates, Jews left Germany as refugees in terrible distress, trying to reach any possible destination. In July 1938, the Vienna Conference took place. It was convened by President Franklin D. Roosevelt to deal with the Jewish refugee problem. 
Roosevelt called for an international conference to promote the immigration of Austrian and German Jewish refugees and create an international organization whose purpose would be to deal with a general refugee problem. The president invited delegates from 32 countries, including the United States, Great Britain, France, Canada, six small European democratic nations, the Latin American nations, Australia, and New Zealand. When he proposed the conference, Roosevelt made it clear that no country would be forced to change its immigration quotas, but would instead be asked to volunteer changes. During the conference, it became painfully obvious that no country was willing to volunteer anything. The French delegate declared that France had reached the extreme point of saturation as regards to admission of refugees. Myron C. Taylor, the American delegate, agreed for the United States to make the previously unfilled quota for Germans and Austrians available to these new refugees. The United States was recuperating from the economic depression of 1929, and its rate of unemployment was very high, which greatly influenced the country's policy toward the refugees. Other countries claimed the depression as their excuse for not accepting refugees. T.W. White, Australia's delegate at the Vian Conference, said that, under the circumstances, Australia cannot do more. As we have no real problem, we are not desirous of importing one. Only the Dominican Republic, a tiny country in the West Indies, volunteered to take in refugees. In exchange for huge amounts of money, they offered to give 100,000 visas. However, in the end, fewer than 695 Jews arrived in this country. The conference did call for the establishment of the Intergovernmental Committee on Refugees, ICR. Its goals were to help safe haven candidate countries develop opportunities for refugee settlement and to try and convince Germany to allow organized emigration. However, ICR member countries did not give the organization neither the funding nor the authority it needed to make a real difference. Thus, whatever good the Vian Conference set out to do was buried in the sand, and the world's democracies had made it extremely clear that they were not willing to help European Jewry. The British delegate claimed that Britain was already fully populated and suffering from unemployment, so it could take in no refugees. The land of Israel, which was under British mandate at the time, was not a viable alternative, as the British implemented in it the white paper policy, greatly restricting the entrance of Jews. Domestic and international pressure forced the British government to open its own gates to some 10,000 unaccompanied children from the area of the Reich in their children transports. Henry von Erd, Ne Heinz Lichtwitz was one of these children. Let's listen to him. Well, I'm internally grateful to Britain for what they did for me. Um, that's why when uh, Yad Vashem kindly asked me to present my book to David Cameron, then Prime Minister, it was a very, very emotional experience to me, a little six-year-old refugee boy, 80 years later, more or less, being able to prevent, present a book to a prime minister of that country and talk to him. Having said that, um, I don't forget that a lot more Jews could have been saved, both coming to Britain and both coming to Palestine, and that they weren't saved was also uh, a result of British policy. But um, as far as I'm concerned, they saved my life, and I'm eternally grateful to them. Let's return to the story of the artist. And what happened to Felix Newsbaum and his wife, Felka Platek? Living in hiding in Brussels, Newsbaum continued painting using materials supplied by his friends. In 1944, he and his wife were caught and sent to Auschwitz in the last transport to leave Belgium, where they were murdered. 